All right, we're going to talk now about the last subject given to me, and that is assurance of faith. Point one, how do you grow it? Point two, how do you lose it? And point three, how do you renew it? And these are the three points that are covered in Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 18, paragraphs 3 and 4. So first of all, how do you grow it? 18.3 says this, This infallible assurance doth not so belong to the essence of faith, but that a true believer may wait long and conflict with many difficulties before he be partaker of it. Yet, being enabled by the Spirit to know the things which are freely given him of God, he may, without extraordinary revelation, extraordinary revelation is what the Roman Catholics said you need to get assurance, in the right use of ordinary means, attain thereunto. That is, you may attain to assurance. And therefore it is the duty of everyone to give all diligence to make his calling and election sure, that thereby his heart may be enlarged in peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, in love and thankfulness to God, and in strength and cheerfulness in the duties of obedience, which are the proper fruits of this assurance, so far is it from inclining men to looseness. You see, the Roman Catholics taught, if you teach that a Christian can get assurance in any other situation than rare, extraordinary revelation, they will start taking God for granted and they'll start becoming antinomians and they'll start getting involved in loose, careless living. And the Reformers and the Puritans said just the opposite. If you have full assurance of faith, you will want to live more godly, you'll want to cultivate more assurance that you will grow in it. So the question is, does love motivate obedience or does it hinder obedience? Um, If you love your spouse, you want to please your spouse and you're all the more keen to live a life of obedience within the confines of marriage. And so when you're a Christian, you see, the Reformers and Puritans said, Rome has it all wrong. All wrong. The New Testament says it's normative for believers to reach at least some measure of assurance and to grow in it. And Rome is all wrong on this idea that if you have assurance, you'll start living carelessly. It's just the opposite. And so this paragraph not only defeats Roman Catholicism, but it also gives us guidelines Uh, Four guidelines, really, it talks about uh, to grow and to cultivate assurance. It talks about the means of attaining assurance, the time factor involved in getting it, the duty in pursuing it, and the fruits produced by it. So we want to look at each of those four uh, very, very briefly uh, right now. So first of all, the time, the time involved. According to the Westminster Confession, a true believer may, doesn't say it has to be, but may wait long and conflict with many difficulties before he be partaker of it. But that it's normative over a period of time that he grows up, that's chapter 14, paragraph 3, he grows up to attain a full assurance. So the acorn of faith, will normally, over time, evolve into the oak tree of full assurance. So at the beginning, faith may be small, it may produce fruit 30-fold, but it will eventually, by God's grace, if we don't backslide, produce 60-fold and 100-fold and grow into full assurance. Now, grace usually grows with age. So that as faith increases, other graces increase as well. The Puritans often said something like this, Young believers normally display much zeal, but older saints, this is Richard Sibbs, grow more in strength and stableness and become more refined and mature. 
Thomas Brooks, Assurance is meat for strong men. Few babes, if any, are able to bear it and digest it. Charles Spurgeon would later say that some young believers make a great mistake by expecting ripe fruit upon a tree in springtime, and because that season yields nothing but blossoms, they conclude the tree to be barren. That mistake can bring barrenness and darkness upon their own souls. And so though believers ought to strive for assurance, they must remember that it would be very unusual for them to have a high degree of mature assurance when they're but babes in grace, when they're just beginning to learn to walk by faith and not by sight. Now that does not mean to say that age and experience guarantee assurance. Nor is it impossible for God to plant faith and full assurance simultaneously in a babe in grace. But the Puritans are talking about what is normative, not about what God can possibly do. With God, all things are possible. But as in conversion, God is sovereign in measuring out the degree of assurance to his people that he grants to them. And primarily... God works that assurance by degrees so that as you grow in grace, you grow in assurance as well. Now, there can be times in a young believer's life if a young believer comes in dire, dire need, maybe a heavy set of afflictions, that God gives extra grace and extra assurance for the time being. Burgess compared it to a baby that was greatly distressed and crying out. And how the mother goes and reassures the baby of her love. And so God sometimes gives young believers, also young believers in their time of first love, when they first come to know Jesus, seem to have large dosages of assurance for a while. And then later some of that can fade. So there can be some ups and downs at the beginning. But gradually, the typical believer is on a trajectory of what we call progressive sanctification that leads him to higher and higher levels of assurance of faith. Now, what? secondly, what are the means that God uses to allow the believer, by His Spirit, to cultivate that assurance? Well, 18.3 goes on to say, it's not extraordinary revelation, but it's the right use, very important here, of ordinary means, that is, ordinary spiritual disciplines. And four of these are predominant. God's Word, the sacraments, prayer, and then interestingly, the Puritans called afflictions, a means that God uses, because they were commonly experiencing great affliction, and in great affliction, God comes with His grace greater than our need, so that we experience that no affliction comes upon us that surprises God, but God is able, as 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, with the affliction to give an escape whereby we may be able to bear it. And one of those escapes, even though the affliction doesn't change, one of those escapes is that God often grants His people greater measures of assurance in affliction so that they can bear the affliction and give Him great glory through that affliction, so that others can see in them the amazing work of God. Now, how does God's Word do that? Well, both law and gospel, both precept and promise, when read and heard and believed and obeyed and memorized and meditated on and prayed and sung, the Word is God's primary road to holiness to spiritual growth, and to assurance of faith. That's why Peter advises, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So if you would grow in assurance, you've got to be in the Scriptures. Not just casually reading it. Not just trying to do a whole day, a yearly calendar, and just saying, oh, I read four chapters today. Great. No, you've got to be in there studying the Word, meditating on the Word, 
memorizing the Word, searching the Word, living the Word, loving the Word, listening to the Word. Every one of those things I just said, I can supply you proof text with. The Bible talks a lot about cultivating assurance from the Bible. If you compare Scripture with Scripture, you take time to study the Word, you believe the Word, you listen to the Word, you're teachable, you're obedient to it, you discipline your heart to apply it, you're dependent upon it, and you persevere in it. It's God's normal way to bless that so that you grow in grace and you grow in assurance. I want to tell you a story. I, uh, I was once, so I had my bags all packed to go to a conference in California. And just as I was leaving, I got a phone call from one of my elders. He said, I'm in a bad way. Uh, I've backslidden from the Lord. I fear I'm a reprobate. I'm an abomination to the Lord. I can't pray. I can't even think straight. Uh, I'm a basket case. Would you come over and help me? I said, oh man, I, I'm so sorry, but I, I just have to leave right now. But um, I'll, I'll be back in three days. I'll come over. And meanwhile, I want you to spend 30 minutes every day alone with the Lord. 10 minutes reading your Bible, 10 minutes meditating on what you've read, and 10 minutes in prayer. He said, I can't do that. I said, what do you mean you can't do that? He said, my prayer is an abomination to God. I said, brother, it's a double abomination when you don't pray. <laughs> you must do that. He said, I can't. I said, you must. He said, well, I'll try. I came back three days later, and there was a note on my chair in my study from my secretary. It said, no need to visit so-and-so. All is well with his soul. <laughs> he just got back into the Word. You see, why is it that Christians think they can distance themselves from the Word and somehow grow in grace? Now, I want, I want to do some math with you. And this is, this is Puritanesque as well. You're three hours a week in church, probably, maybe four. You're 164 hours in a week out in the world. If you're not reading the Bible every day, how do you expect those three or four hours to sustain you in, the, in this mighty current of secularization that's coming at you in all those other hours? You need a daily time alone with the Lord for your own soul. In His Word, studying the Scriptures, getting a good Bible study book where He has good notes and, and, and these family worship sections that we just put in, I, I highly recommend them to you. And, and get that Bible if you can. And, and, and read. Read the Bible. Read the notes. Uh, read the meditations to help you worship God privately. That's why we call each section at the end of each chapter Thoughts for private as well as family worship. And it's amazing how people will grow when they're really into the Word. A Puritan Richard Greenham wrote an entire little book on just how to read the Bible. It's got eight chapters, and every chapter is only one word in its title. And one of the chapters is diligence. And Greenham says, in that chapter, you should dig in the Bible like a man digging for hid treasure, gold, underneath the, underneath the earth. You turn over a spade, and you're looking for gold. And there's gold everywhere in the Bible. You see, so you, you, you grow when you're really into the Word, meditating upon it. Now, we've lost the art of meditation today for the most part. Did you know that the, the Puritans wrote 41 different books just on the art of meditation? 41. And they believed in two kinds of meditation, deliberate meditation and occasional meditation. Deliberate meditation is every day in your private devotional time, you, you have a set time where you meditate on something you read from that chapter. Be it a verse, be it a doctrine. You, if, you're, if you're feeling desensitized in your conscience of sin, you might meditate for one day on the heinousness of sin. If you're feeling a little more distance from Christ, you might meditate one day on the, the beauty of the offices of Christ and how His prophetical, priestly, and kingly office meet all your needs. Whatever it might be, you choose different subjects every day and you meditate, the Puritan said, on these things. And that helps you to grow. But we've lost that art. 
I'm afraid. And the Puritans called meditation, you see, the halfway house between Scripture reading and prayer. They'd read a verse, they'd meditate a minute, they'd pray a minute, they'd go back and read another verse, meditate, pray, read, meditate, pray, read, meditate, pray. That's how to do it. Don't just read 20 verses straight and then suddenly go to prayer without meditating on what you've read. Your prayers will end up sounding the same every day. And you'll forget what you've read right away. So the Puritans are light years ahead of us on how to glean grace from the Word of God for their own souls by this simple method. Meditate, read, sorry, meditate, and pray. They called it chewing the cud. You you chew over what you're reading. You reflect about it. And they said meditation helps augment assurance by preventing vain and sinful thoughts, by providing inner resources on which to draw, by being a weapon against temptation, by providing relief in affliction, and by glorifying God. And then you go out and you ask God for grace to practice what you've just read and meditated and prayed about. Now, the Puritans also believe strongly in reading good books as part of their Bible study. And here's how they did it. If you take a book of John Owen and you open it up, you'll see about 35 scriptural references on every page, on an average. They encouraged their people to look up every one of those. So when you read sentence by sentence of these good old writers who are just as familiar with Habakkuk as they are with Romans, because they knew their whole Bible equally well, you get immersed in the Word as you read. And you grow as they teach you doctrine by doctrine, based on the Word of God. And I can say honestly to you, that if you ask me what, what spiritual discipline has helped me the most in my life of faith and assurance, without hesitation, I would say to you, reading the old divines has brought me into the Word much more deeply and nourished my soul, left me many a time weeping before God for the greatness of His grace. Uh, these good old books are just wonderful, wonderful food for the soul. And so I try to read them and have it direct me back to Scripture and learn and grow from their much greater wisdom than I've ever had. Now, number two is the sacraments. Reformed people sometimes forget about the value of the sacraments. But the sacraments complement the Word. They point us away from themselves. Each sign in the sacraments, the water, the bread, the wine, directs us to believe in Christ and His sacrifice on the cross. The sacraments are visible means through which God invisibly communes with us, comes down to our level, addresses every one of our physical senses. In the Lord's Supper, for example, we taste the bread and the wine, we we touch it, we, we see it, we hear the word as it comes to us. We... All five senses are involved. The sacraments are spurs to Christ's likeness and therefore to holiness and assurance. In fact, it confused me a while in my original studies on assurance that the Puritans would talk about sacramental assurance. And I thought for a while they were saying this is a different kind of assurance. But after a while I realized, no, what they simply meant by it was that We don't get a different Christ. We don't get a different kind of assurance in the sacraments than we do under the Word. But it's so common for God to increase the faith of His people in the sacraments. In fact, the purpose of the sacraments is to strengthen their faith that they just spoke of it as sacramental assurance. As the early Puritan Robert Bruce put it, while we do not get a better Christ in the sacraments than we do in the Word, for we get the same Christ, there are times when we get Christ better in the sacraments. So, not just the Lord's Supper, but also baptism. When someone is baptized, be it an adult or, or in paedo-baptist circles, an infant, you, you don't 
think about the infant. You don't think just about the adult. That baptism is not just about those individuals. That baptism is a message to the whole congregation. Surely as water is used as a symbol of cleansing of the blood of Christ, so surely God signifies and seals in baptism the washing away of all the sins of His people through the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. So in the Lord's Supper and in baptism, we ought to be conscientiously striving to grow in assurance of faith. Then there's prayer. There's prayer. Prayer is a primary means to grow in assurance. Because prayer, as I said, is the other way of communication with God. God comes down to us through His Word. We respond back to God through prayer. John Bunyan defined prayer this way. Prayer is a sincere, sensible, affectionate... Notice there's ten ingredients in his definition of prayer. Prayer is a sincere, sensible, affectionate pouring out of the heart or the soul, to God, through Christ, in the strength and assistance of the Holy Spirit, for such things as God has promised, according to His Word, for the good of the church, and with submission and faith to the will of God. That's an incredible definition. Actually, there's 11 things there. 11 parts that come together in true prayer. Bunyan's little book on prayer is a gem, by the way. And Bunyan says this at the beginning of his book, you can do more than pray after you pray, but you can never do more than pray until you prayed. So you're to start everything with prayer, you see. If you want to grow in assurance, what you do is you commend your day to the Lord when you get up in the morning in prayer, and then you commend everything that you do in that day. You always begin it with prayer. So you don't append prayer at the end. Or you don't skip prayer altogether. But you develop what they call the holy habit of prayer. That you pray your way through the day. And the Puritan said, that's what praying without ceasing means. You can't pray 24-7, nor are you called to. But praying without ceasing means that you commend everything to the Lord in prayer. And when you have that tender life with the Lord, that close life, that assured life with the Lord you find yourself praying not just at your stated time every day, but throughout the day. Spontaneous prayers. Occasional prayers, the Puritans called it. Where your heart just darts up to God. Lord, help me here. I'm, I'm a, you're a mother at home. Help me with this child's temper. You pray before you act. You see, you pray through the day. When I was first ordained to the ministry, a reformed minister came to see me. I was 25 years old. He was like 75. Two days after I was ordained, and I was very grateful for him. First minister I ever visited as a minister. And I asked him the question, as I asked ministers for for decades, what could you teach a younger man like me? And I'll never forget what that man said. I don't have much to teach you, he said. He was very humble. Well, he said, there's one thing. There's one thing. Never, never undertake anything in the ministry without praying about it. Even if you've done a class 40 times in a row, you pray again. You need God's help again. Every time you need God's help. And you see, that's what we need to do as a way of life. In the 19th century, there was a a discussion group of ministers in England. John Newton was there. Thomas Scott was there. And they would propound a question. Once a week, they meet together for an hour. They'd all come with their answers, and they discuss it. And there's a guy named uh, Reverend Pratt. He took notes. Banner Truth published it as a book about 30 years ago. It's out of print again now. Thoughts of uh, Evangelical Leaders or something like that. And one day, they took up the question, what does it mean to pray without ceasing? And they couldn't come to an agreement. And so there was a young lady there who came to give them refreshments halfway through their meeting. And one of the ministers popped her the question. He said, maybe this young woman can tell us what it means to pray without ceasing. Oh, sir, she said, it's, it's, it's not that difficult. When I get up in the morning and I clothe myself, I just say, Lord, clothe me with the righteousness of Jesus today. 
And when I came down and dusted the furniture before you came, I said, Lord, take away all the dust and dirt of my heart. And when I just said before you uh, water to drink and, and food to eat, I, I just said, Lord, be, be, the, be my water of life and feed me with spiritual food convenient for me. So I just kind of pray my way through the day like that. And they said, that's it. That's it. You see, that's the way to pray. You're living a close life with the Lord. It's like Nehemiah. You know in the book of Nehemiah? Everything that happens to him. He darts up a little prayer. Oh, help me, God. Remember me, oh Lord, for good. <laughs> again and again throughout this book. I wonder if your prayer life is like that. Do you have those darting prayers up to God? Don't they draw you closer to God? Don't they increase your assurance when God hears those cries? Prayer is a wonderful means to grow in assurance. John Bunyan said, Pray often, for prayer is a shield to the soul, a sacrifice to God, and a scourge for Satan. But then there are afflictions. Afflictions. Through afflictions, though they are not technically a means of grace, God uses them, He uses conflicts and doubts and trials to mature believers' faith. Assurance often grows best in winter, said the Puritans. It follows intense spiritual warfare and it often bears battle scars. Burgess wrote, This privilege of assurance is given to those who have been acquainted with God, usually for some time, are much exercised in His ways, and have endured many trials for Him. Assurance is often the fruit of strengthened and seasoned faith. So if you want to grow in assurance, prayerfully use the ordinary means of Scripture, the sacraments, prayer, and ask God, as the Puritans would say, to improve your afflictions for your spiritual growth so that you may walk with a good conscience before Him. And there are other means, of course, they talked about. Many Puritans used a spiritual journal and they would write their thoughts and their convictions down. Uh, On their birthday, they would always uh, use it as a day of humiliation, thinking about their sins of the past year, and as a day of praise, thinking about God's grace. And they would often go back in their spiritual journal and read how God had been faithful to them for the last year to strengthen them, to strengthen their faith. Now, this is not an obligation, of course, but it's something many Puritans found helpful. Writing out their thoughts, writing out their prayers, not for publication, not for anyone else's eyes to read, but just to grow in assurance themselves. Now, thirdly, the duty. I'll be short here. It's the duty of everyone to give all diligence to make his calling and election sure. Second Peter 1.10. You can't argue with that. Straight scripture. And so Burgess affirms in his writings that the Westminster Confession's conviction that assurance must be pursued as a duty should teach every believer that they should not rest spiritually until they can rest with a measure of assurance that God is my God and my Savior. Now Thomas Brooks, in his helpful book, Heaven on Earth, provides a list of ways for you to pursue the duty of maintaining and strengthening your assurance. This is what he says, five things. Number one, be diligent in using the means of grace and spiritual disciplines, which we just heard about. Number two, Meditate often on your spiritual and eternal privileges, such as your adoption, justification, and reconciliation with God. Number three, value Christ even more than your assurance. The giver is always bigger than the gifts. Number four, use the degree of assurance you have to strengthen your soul against temptations and corruptions and to improve your Christian resolutions, affections, and life. And number five, walk humbly with your God, guarding against those sins that have damaged the assurance of other believers, and consider solemnly the dreadful evils that would accompany your loss of assurance. So it's your duty. 
to pursue and cultivate assurance. And then finally, 18.3 says, there are fruits that are produced by assurance. So you can, you can tell whether you are growing or not if you're growing in these fruits. Westminster says, your heart will be enlarged in joy and peace in the Holy Ghost, in love and thankfulness to God, in strength and cheerfulness in the duties of obedience. All these are the proper fruits of this assurance. So assurance elevates the soul to God-glorifying and soul-satisfying affections. It produces holy living, marked by spiritual peace, joyful love, humble gratitude, cheerful obedience, and heartfelt mortification of sin. And these fruits invigorate the life of faith and press in upon the person's whole life so that there's a deeper life of intercessory prayer for others. There's an enlargement of the soul so that you can go outside of yourself because you're assured that your own state is secure and you can become more concerned about others and live lives of service much more freely than if you lack assurance of faith. Assurance, therefore, brings many, many wonderful fruits. First of all, it transforms trials. It transforms trials. In the middle of Job's trials, he turns to God and says, I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. In my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My Redeemer, my flesh. Martin Luther says, assurance consists of personal pronouns. And it's the personal pronouns that give me vibrant joy in my Christianity. It is my flesh, I shall see, my eyes shall behold. And it's all focused on the Redeemer. But it's personal, you see. And that gives assurance that transforms me, transforms Job in the midst of enduring the sorest of trials. And number two, assurance produces the fruit of contentment. Contentment. Even in the midst of painful trials, yes. Habakkuk 3, 17, Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall the fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olives shall fail. The fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off in the field, and there shall be no herd in the cattle, in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Contentment. Contentment is godliness with great gain. When I was 10 years old, my mother was a very God-fearing woman. I asked her, Mother, how old would you want to be if you could be any age you wanted to be? She was 42 at the time. And she said, 42. And I said, what a coincidence. That's just what you are. (laughs) And she looked at me and she said, I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Oh, I never forgot that. I never forgot that. That's how you want to live as a Christian. If you're 80, you want to be 80. If you're 20, you want to be 20. You see, you learn to be content with God's sovereign dispensations in your life because you're His child. And he makes no mistakes. And you believe that. And his faithful track record in your life confirms that. That God knows better how to rule you than you know how to rule yourself. You can better hand the keys over to him. And my wife and I travel a lot. And when we drive, she's a better driver than I am. And I let her drive 60, 65% of the time. But uh, a wise Christian lets the Lord drive 100% of the time. You want to turn the keys over to God because He knows how to rule you better than you rule yourself. And thirdly, another important fruit of assurance is that it produces and heightens holiness. It heightens your holiness. The more assurance you have, the more, said Puritan Robert Harris, you grow out of yourself and beyond yourself and become more humble within yourself and low in your own eyes. Assurance keeps you humble 
and cheerful and godly. And finally, assurance, said one Puritan, hastens heaven. I meditated a lot when I read that. Hastens heaven, what's that all about? But what they, what they meant was this. Faith will get us from earth to heaven, but assurance brings heaven down to earth. So we taste it now. A foretaste of the heavenly experience. Listen to Brooks. Genuine holiness will yield you a heaven hereafter, but genuine assurance will yield you a heaven here. He who has holiness and knows it shall have two heavens. A heaven of joy, comfort, peace, contentment, and assurance here, and a heaven of happiness and blessedness hereafter. The Puritans were fond of saying this. The believers get best of both worlds. They have a true joy here that the world knows not of, the joy of communion with God in Christ and assurance of faith. And they have the superlative utopian joy awaiting them in the world to come that the world shall never know at all, but shall experience the reverse. So that's how to cultivate, how to grow holiness in in a Puritan way of thinking. Now, 18.4 then deals with the remaining two questions, which is, How do you lose it, and how do you renew it? I'll try to do these uh, briefly here. Here's 18.4. True believers may have the assurance of their salvation divers ways, that is, in different ways, shaken, diminished, or intermitted, interrupted, as by negligence in preserving it, by falling into some special sin which wounds the conscience and grieves the spirit, by some sudden or vehement temptation, by God's withdrawing the light of his countenance and suffering even such as fear him to walk in darkness and have no light. So that's all how you lose it. Yet, here's how you get it back, yet are they never utterly destitute of that seed of God, the life of faith, that love of Christ and the brethren, that sincerity of heart and conscience of duty, out of which, by the operation of the Spirit, this assurance may in due time be revived, and by the which, in the meantime, they are supported from utter despair. There is a world of careful, beautiful, pastoral theology packed into this one paragraph. So basically, what the divines are saying is, there are two causes for assurance to be lost. The first cause, and the the easiest way to lose assurance, the most common way to lose assurance, is because of sin in the believer. Sin and backsliding. The negligence in preserving assurance by falling into special sin or by sluggishness in using the spiritual means of grace. And so Burgess says... Assurance can be diminished when we deeply feel the guilt of sin, but refuse to go to the fountain of remedy. Satan hates assurance and will do everything he can to keep doubts and fears alive within us. So 1 John 2, 15 and 16 warns us that those who love the world with all its lusts of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life will perish with the world unless they repent and return from their backsliding. And God says in Jeremiah that my people, my people are bent to backsliding from me. We're easily prone to become spiritually lazy, stop using the means of grace diligently, and backslide and inch our way, inch by inch, back to a secular kind of lifestyle, at least to some degree. Backsliding is a common sin for the people of God. And as common as it is dreadful, backsliding is a God-dishonoring, Christ-rejecting, spirit-grieving, law-trampling, and gospel-abusing sin. God hates backsliding. Backsliding is an insult to God. Why would you ever leave the fountain of life and love and light? for the empty cisterns of this poor, perishing world. But backsliding begins most of the time in the inner closet. 
the loss of interest in secret prayer, the loss of enjoyment in secret prayer. And prayer becomes very hard work, perfunctory, and it spreads from the lack of prayer to the lack of private study of the word, the lack of meditation, the lack of interest in the preached word, the lack of fellowship with and love for fellow believers, slowness to confess Christ, the loss of evangelistic passion for the lost, an inward coldness to all the spiritual disciplines, one step after another. And we grow more distant from God. And then the world becomes more attractive. The spirit of this age, its worldly entertainment, its venues, its fashions, its customs, its places, its people, adds fizz to the soda or the coke of backsliding that does huge damage to our spiritual health. And soon we become spiritually lazy and sloppy. The Bible's word for it is slothfulness. We promote selfishness above service. We fail to embrace God's fatherly and sovereign providences. We tolerate unmortified sin. We use entertainment that stains and hardens our consciences. We yield to temptation. We succumb to patterns of disobedience. We embrace man-centered hopes. We deny Christ by abstaining from the Lord's Supper, perhaps. We replace true self-examination with false presumption. And we soon we're living a double life that no longer earnestly fights against growing inner corruptions. And we flirt with secret sins we long thought were dead and buried. All of this impacts our assurance negatively. So the Christian cannot enjoy high levels of assurance while he persists in low levels of obedience. Then we chase away our assurance, said Burgess. Nothing will darken thy soul more than a dull and lazy and negligent walk of life. That's why we need preaching every week. Preaching ought to wound us a little bit every week. Get us back in the pathway. Like we're like sheep that are always wandering, always prone to, to go outside the path. We need those shepherd dogs of mercy and grace to come behind us and nip us on the back of our, our knees and direct the sheep back into the path and reinvigorate us through the means of grace. Well, when assurance degenerates into presumption, it's actually good that doubts and fears prompt fresh desire for assurance. It urges us to repentance. Fear to fall and assurance to stand our two sisters, said Thomas Fuller. So the conclusion is clear. Despite the great injury that ensues from backsliding, God will not allow His people to backslide all the way. His people shall persevere. Their perseverance is secured 18.4 goes on to say, by their persevering God. God will keep the feet of His saints. No enemy shall keep the believer out of heaven, but the believer may well keep heaven out of his own heart on earth by sinning against God. And so, therefore, it's an unworthy thing, said Burgess, to complain about the loss of God's favor and assurance if all your duties are our, and performances are careless and withered. So, if that applies to you today, and you become careless in your prayer, careless in your use of the means, you get back into using the means carefully and prayerfully, and God will bless you in the process, I'm sure. But now you have something more complicated. Causes in God, causes in God, why we lose some assurance. What do you make of that? The confession speaks of vehement temptation and the withdrawing of the light of God's countenance. What does that mean? There are many people who've done commentaries on the Westminster Confession and they say, they went too far here. God never withdraws the light of His countenance from His people. Well, that's wrong. That's dead wrong. Isaiah 50, verse 10 says he does. So do many of the Psalms. And sometimes it's unexplainable. And so what the past, what the Puritan pastors are doing here is they're being real pastors to their people. 
Because sometimes the believer has not backslidden. And you know that in your own life, I trust. You haven't backslidden. You, you long for more communion with God. But somehow, somehow it just seems like it's become dark in your soul. And the Puritans, instead of beating up on those people, they reach out passionately to them and say, and they say, God has sovereign reasons for doing what he does at all occasions, even for withdrawing at times the light of his countenance. And Thomas Brooks gives us some reasons, a list of reasons. So does Anthony Burgess. I'll just read you Burgess's here. He's got five reasons. Sometimes he says God withdraws assurance from his people that we may taste and see how bitter sin is. Second, that God does it sometimes to make us low and humble, to show us our dependency upon him for any assurance we do have. Third, that when we have assurance, we may esteem it more and take heed that we do not lose it. Fourth, that we may demonstrate obedience to God and give him greater honor because we give Him greater honor in times of darkness than in times of light when we believe in Him. And fifth, that we may offer comfort to others in similar distress. So you have to recognize here the Puritans are being pastoral in helping their people face what's what they called spiritual melancholy or spiritual desertion. Those times when God has His holy reasons for withdrawing the light of his countenance. At such times, John 13, 7 is reality. What I do now you don't know, but you shall know hereafter. God does it for his own fatherly reasons, out of fatherly discipline and fatherly sovereignty and fatherly wisdom. And then finally, 18.4 says, God will revive his people. So, We don't only need to grow our assurance, fight against losing our assurance, but there's always a way of renewing assurance. That is to go back to God, to go back to Christ, the same way we got it the first time. Repenting, believing, using the means of grace, waiting on God, the same way we get it back again the second time. As backsliding begins with a neglect of genuine prayer and dependency on the Spirit, Revival of assurance begins with renewed prayer, confession of sin, forsaking of sin, and a longing cry of the heart that the Spirit be not taken from us. Like David, as was read in Psalm 51. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Bring me back, Lord. William Cooper describes it this way poetically. Oh, for a closer walk with God, a calm and heavenly frame, a light to shine upon the road that leads me to the Lamb. Where is the blessedness I knew when first I saw the Lord? Where is the soul-refreshing view of Jesus and His Word? What peaceful hours I once enjoyed! How sweet their memory still! But they left an aching void the world can never fill. Return, O holy dove, return, sweet messenger of rest. I hate the sins that made thee mourn and drove thee from my breast. The dearest idol I have known, whate'er that idol be, help me to tear it from thy throne and worship only thee. So shall my walk be close with God, calm and serene my frame, so purer light shall mark the road that leads me to the Lamb. Is that your prayer with me today? Oh, God, deliver me from every backsliding way. Work in me a fresh repentance, a fresh return. Be always converting me, O God. Be always making me more humble, more sensitive of sin, more near to Christ Jesus. Grow my assurance. Revive my assurance. Don't let me despair. Let me cast myself again upon Thee. God will revive you. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord.